All right. We're anxious to hear this because it applies us as how we grow our orchard, what we need to do to it. Yeah, thank you, John. And, you know, this is what, John, the sixth year that you and I have worked together on this? So, and I've gotten to know John over the years, and I've got to say he is really nice to work with, him and his family and his, his entire outfit. He's very gracious. So I'd like to have everyone just give John a round of applause because he's the one that puts this together. Okay. Now the other thing is I want you to do is I want you to all put your hand out like this. All right, take your other hand and no. Yeah! <laughs> Go Gators. <laughs> all right. Now and the speakers this year, how incredible have they been? Really awesome. Now and about the only thing that comes close to that are the baked goods. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> all right. So, so we're all there. And I want to thank you for inviting me here. And it's so good to work with you folks. And we're going to do it again next year and the year after. Right, John? Yes, sir. Great. All right. So let's talk a little bit about greenhouse management. I want this to be as much as a talk as a discussion. So anyone that wants to add to this as I'm going along, please do. And some of the things I would like to, for you to learn today is how effective sanitation can reduce pest problems. And, and this is crucial and crucial to know. We have a, a number of greenhouse operations uh, in the, in the multi-county area and I go and visit them. And, and they might have problems with diseases or they might have problems with insects or they may have problems with with weeds or, or whatever. And the number, one, the number one issue that they have is greenhouse sanitation. So that's really gonna be important. And what causes that? What does cause these sanitation problems and goals? We're gonna try to lay out some goals for a sanitation program and control methods to provide a sanitary environment. And then finally, we're gonna talk about some fertilizer, fertilizer management, and some fertilizer recommendations. So anybody recognize these folks here? <laughs> yeah. So, oh no, I just put that in there. No. <laughs> it could be last year, because you wouldn't let me talk last year, right? <laughs> All right, so what is plant sanitation? Everybody will probably have a different, a, a different uh, meaning for it or so, but to, to put this down, we have the formulation and application of measures designed to protect plant health. And ultimately, that's what you wanna do. Think about the amount of money you have invested in your orchid collection and how much time and energy and input you put into it Sanitation is crucial. And also those effective sanitation practices will reduce the delay and onslaught of what? Pests like, like mites and weeds, diseases, mealybugs, right? So that's, that's your goal. Your goal in any greenhouse is to have an effective sanitation process. And that starts by laying it all out. What do you want to do? Taking a look at your overall greenhouse, how your sanitation practices are. So pathogens and weeds can find their ways into, into to anywhere, really. You look at it, you have root substrates, right, that you can bring in, containers, under the bench, plants that are purchased maybe here. Not that I'm saying no, anyone's plants might have a mealybug in them or anything, of course not, but they can be brought in from other areas. Easily introduced through shoes and clothing. How many wear bright colored shirts when they're working in the greenhouse? Yeah, number one, it attracts insects. That bright colors, yellows especially. You ever see in, a, in where you see the yellow sticky traps? Right? So, you know, you can just have a little hitchhiker come on that shirt of yours, and then the next thing you know, away you go. All right? So some of the goals of sanitation are prevention. And I think, you know, seclusion is, is crucial. Uh, not far from where John's, John's uh, shop is, uh, we used to have uh, uh, Kraft, Kraft Nursery. And, you know, he had a huge problem 
with weeds. And, and it cost him probably $5,000 to bring a crew in to hand weed his inventory. And a lot of that I said, you know, to him, I said, Kevin, prevention is a huge, huge way that you can prevent that. And inspection, you got to go in there, you got to, you know, you got to get in there, you got to look at your plants, you got to look down there, down at the base where you might find those mealy bugs, right? So inspection, and that becomes part of that integrated pest management program that we talk about. Right? Integrated pest management where you're looking for the insects uh, or looking at diseases, looking at the potential for weed seeds, things of that nature. Environmental control, how important is that? You know, making sure that within that greenhouse that you have a good temperature, a consistent temperature, that uh, you're not over irrigating and getting things too humid, and eradication. And this is right here, that's next to impossible, isn't it? In the, in the nursery system, eradication really isn't a practical goal because it's going to cost you too much time, it's going to cost you too much money. So what do we look for? We look for suppression. We look to try to keep those, those pests to a minimum. Okay, so the big three causes of sanitation, weeds, disease, and guess what? Us, humans, right? So these are three major problems. And let's go through each one individually. So weeds in in your pots, or let's start there, okay? What can they do? They're going to detract, of course, from the, the plant itself. But what else do they do? Suck up nutrients. They suck up nutrients, absolutely, in water, okay? So, and you know what? They're really efficient, weeds are, don't you know? They are a lot more efficient sometimes than your plants are. And they also deprive that target plant, like we said, of water and uh, nutritional needs. Now, on the outside, on the outside of your greenhouse, what can weeds do? They attract, they can be alternative hosts for insects, just kind of hang out there like it when it's good and then some plants come in or something. Uh, they'll, uh, they'll, come to the, they'll come to the host plant. Uh, vegetable production is, is really, there is something with weeds and, and vegetable production where you will have the insects hang out on various types of weeds and then as the crop comes in, they'll migrate to that. So, Again, weeds on the exterior part of your greenhouse need to be controlled just as important as on the inside. So if you're purchasing a plant, what do you want to do? You want to take a look and see, make sure that it's weed free, right? There's nothing coming up in the soil. You want to make sure that that's clean. That's a, that's a part of that uh, program. Okay, and they're also, like I said, they're going to harbor uh, insects such as white flies and aphids and scales and mealybugs, mites, slugs. We've been talking about slugs here for quite a bit now. Thrips, right? Thrips, uh, especially uh, flower uh, thrips, big problem. So let's let's take a look at how you can how you can start to build your mindset on how you might be able to protect yourself from some of these problems in the, uh, in the greenhouse. So the first thing is, is that all new plants, and I believe, gentlemen back there, you talked about that in your nursery, where you isolate those plants, right? You're gonna isolate them before you even move them into the nursery. Years back in the ornamental nursery uh, uh, industry, we had a problem with pink hibiscus mealybug. Anybody remember those, pink hibiscus mealybugs? Well, what had happened was is that those, those insects came in on plants from down in the homestead area, down in Miami, all right? And the gentleman who owned the nursery took, went down there, got the plants, brought them back up, brought them right into his nursery. Okay, so along comes DPI, DPI comes along, starts, starts looking for uh, different insects and finds the pink hibiscus mealybug and immediately closes that man's nursery down. Quarantines everything, okay? So, <laughs> and it cost him thousands of dollars to get that nursery back up and running. The, the uh, recommendation at the time was Marathon. 
I think it was a Marathon WP. And the problem was is that you couldn't even find that product locally. So not only could he, did, so he ended up having to burn a lot of his stock. That's what ended up happening. So from that, from the ashes came a program that we started using here in our county was to completely isolate plants before they come into the nursery. And I put together scouting books for the, for the nursery owners and, you know, so that when they came off the truck, they looked at them, that they had a 10X, uh, oh, that go back naturally? They, uh, huh. there we go. I got each one of them a, a little hand lens. I had them, uh, I got them an IPM book, a little a notebook, and, and you all should have the same. Then I would just get in there, be able to, to look at your plants individually. You got to know where those insects are going to be, right? Mealybugs you usually find down there tucked in the base of the plant, okay? Slugs maybe underneath, underneath the, the benches, and a little notebook, okay? What did you find? How many of them did you find? Is it time to start to, to use a control method? Is, are you going to introduce mealy, or are you going to introduce uh, lady beetles or lacewing? Are you going to use biological control? That's the mindset that you have to go at for these, these cultural controls, but it all starts by knowing what's coming in on that plant. Okay. So, when we look at greenhouse weeds, they're really, like I said, they're easily, they can adapt to the right temperature and watering, uh, and they'll produce an enormous amount of seed. Uh, we have a, a couple of these weeds, for instance, uh, that come in around nurseries. Crowfoot, has anybody ever heard of that? Crowfoot, it like, actually looks like it has a little crow's foot to it. But inside each one of those little pods are about 10,000 seeds. And when those things bust open, forget it. I mean, you've just got it everywhere. So you have to, uh, of course, be careful on these, these weeds. Again, you want to try to keep your, keep your uh, greenhouse clean around the edges of it and uh, Make sure that when you're bringing your plants in, that they are weed free. Now, some of the weeds that tend to grow really quickly, uh, oxialis, the spurges, of course, new plants can be a source of intruders. We talked about that. Uh, and they might have a very short life cycle, but still you need to be careful about that. So you have to know the, uh, the life cycle of that weed also. So if you're going to go in, let's say, and you're going to chemically control, if that weed is, is in its adult stages where it's flowered and maybe already tossed seed, heck, it could be too late. You want to get that weed when it is young in its initial uh, couple of uh, cotyledons and uh, be very... Uh, dil diligent there. Okay. So also in a greenhouse, and this was a problem we were having at one of them, where we had the weed seeds coming in through uh, ventilator fans. Uh, again, infested uh, plants, uh, uncovered soil under benches and walkways. You know, you can get algae uh, along your mat when your water is maybe rushing out of your, your pot. So uh, you need to be uh, cognizant of some of the other areas where those weed seeds should, uh, are going to be coming in. So what you're going to be looking at is um, exclusion. That's probably the best, the best method. Here's some of the outside weed control, just pictures that I took. Right here you can see these weed seed heads right here, right up against the edge of the, uh, of the screen room, right in here. Some of them actually gotten inside. So, you know, these are all the things you're going to need uh, to be able to prevent uh, weeds from getting in. All right, so uh, additionally, weed control around the greenhouse may also serve to reduce populations of different types of uh, arthropod insects. Let's see what else. Prevention through sanitation, manual removal, right? On the seedlings. Sometimes you don't want to spray inside of a greenhouse house, nor can you. 
that product might not be that might not be uh, licensed or labeled to, to use in a greenhouse or you just don't want to go in there and randomly spray if a fan is on or something like that. So swabbing is a really good method of getting rid of those weeds also. And of course repotting of any affected plants uh, can be the safest. You move those, repot them, and away you go. All right, any questions on, on weeds, how to try to prevent them? Different types, any questions there? Yep. Oh, yes. Do you know of an herbicide that would work on bear paw fern? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, what I would do is, well, question on barefoot, right? Bear paw, or the bear paw fern. Bear, uh, on ferns, basically. Uh, if, you're, if you're gonna do that, I would swab that, probably. And if you're gonna use a, a glyphosate product, like a Roundup, just go at a really strong concentrate. Don't even, you know. Sometimes they just drink that stuff for breakfast. Yeah, well that's great, it's growing in the pot with the orchid. Yeah, yeah, they're, uh, again, swabbing it. You gotta be, yeah. make sure you got your gloves on, glasses, you know, all of that, so. How do you swab? Well, you could, you could take like, a, they have them. If you go to like uh, some of these uh, stores like, uh, like John Deere, they'll have a, a little PVC and they'll have a little swab at the bottom of it. And you put in, you put in your pesticide and then it'll kind of wick, it wicks it and then you just wick right along like that. Yes, sir. And that's good policy. That's what we were talking about with, with the nurseries. Mm -hmm. Yep. What about something to spray in the greenhouse? I'm sorry. What about something to spray in the greenhouse? Well, you'll have to be careful because there are the products that you look at. You got to be really careful with that because it's a an enclosed operation. So there are. You'll have to read that label and see if that product is labeled for use in greenhouse. Okay, question was, in a greenhouse itself, you'll have to check the label to see if the pesticide that you want to use is labeled, is labeled for greenhouse use. Yes, sir. I was just wondering how many of us use or how many people use the Carmex, which is a, uh, a nitrogen-fixing uh, weed killer. Uh, Carmex? So that's kind of new to me. It's a nitrogen fixing herbicide. Yeah, it kills things like oxalis. Hmm? It's old time herbicide. Diuron, okay, that I've heard of. Artillery fur? Yeah. Wow. It's, it's okay. It's good to mix with uh, Roundup. Okay. Dicot? Dicot. Yeah. So, um, I'll probably take a dicot down too. All right. Well, good. Learn something. Excellent. <laughs> Let's talk a, a little bit about uh, diseases. Right? We have that disease triangle. Everybody familiar with the disease triangle? Okay. So what you're going to need to have is you're going to need to have a susceptible host. 
Okay, the susceptible host could be the, be the orchid, right? It could be another ornamental plant. And you also have to have a pathogen. That pathogen has to be present in that susceptible host, but it hasn't been activated yet. So what you need to get that activated is a favorable environment. And what, what do we mean by a favorable environment? Humidity, rain, that sort of thing, right? So once you get all these three working together, guess what? You've got the perfect storm for plant disease. So you always have to be careful about that. You always have to think, okay, well, I'm going to keep an eye on the weather. If you see a lot of rain that's going to be coming in, then you know you may want to maybe you might want to think about going ahead and uh, treating treating your plants. So. When you look at this, it begins by looking at that environmental component. So you can avoid a lot of diseases by simply modifying the environment in which those plants are grown. And maybe cut back on your irrigation. And that's what we see most of the time, problems that we see in greenhouses with diseases is over irrigation. Over irrigation and a lot of the time overhead irrigation. And, and the combination of the two it can be lethal. So that's, that's what we look at when we, go into, when we go into these greenhouses. We start talking about what? Trying to get that irrigation to the root zone, to the root masses. Because if not, if you got, think about this, if you have a lot of your plants together, you know, side by side, packing them in there, that canopy is gonna prevent uh, irrigation from getting to the root zone where you want that to be, right? So that's what you got to start thinking about is how are you going to get your your water, your irrigation into into your root zone? And by it sitting on the on the plant leaf for eight hours, usually that's it. Eight hours of moisture and you're going to start to see some disease problems. So your watering habits become very important as well. Now let's talk about some cultural controls, and I think this is what's, what's key to it. Sanitation, right? If you're, if you're doing any propagating, you want to use sterile cutting tools, right? 25% chlorine bleach, but also that, the hot flame for 15 to 20 seconds. They now have those little butane, uh, butane uh, types of, of hot flame uh, devices that uh, you can use. You want to wash your hands regularly or use a latex gloves. And even the latex gloves, you know, you might want to change those out also because that, there's a good potential that disease can sit on those uh, gloves if you've been using them for too long. Yes? What about the hand sanitizers or the Clorox wipes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, I would think that you could use those. Just be really careful that, you're, that the, you know, it isn't too potent so that you might transfer that over when you're working it with the, uh, with the plants and you might end up burning the leaves. The hand sanitizers to me are best. Yeah, they're, they're good. If they did anything, they probably would have lessened it, huh? More? Really? No, they made it stronger. Really? Huh. Oh, okay. I got you. All right. And then removing contaminated plants. And not only that, but you want to be able to keep your benches clean and you want to keep the floors of your greenhouse clean. All of this goes to sanitation. Uh, again, uh, we had a nursery who had this huge pond. And that's what that nursery used to draw its irrigation water out of. And it recirculated it back. It was a really good and efficient uh, system. But what was going on is that there were some diseases in the plants. And so when they were irrigating, right, that water was hitting the bench. The bench was then hitting the ground. Then it was going back to the recirculating, going back into the pond, and then coming back out through the irrigation. And he was... It was just spreading. They couldn't figure out what was going on. And we took, you know, we took a, a, a ride up there, and I brought some of our specialists down from Gainesville. And we sat there, and that's pretty much what we figured out. So you know, we, we, ended up, uh, we ended up recommending some sanitation methods for them, and we got it cleaned up, and that was that. But I have a question. Yes, sir. Saws and I have to, you know, prune my trees. Mm -hmm. Is it 
trees and there's mm -hmm. other, other tools, um, and it's not practical because maybe you have you know, flame or, or bleach. What do you recommend for saw that's got all those Okay, so the question is, is that if you're sawing, if you have a saw, I would recommend bleach three parts water to one part bleach. And as you move from plant to plant or tree to tree, you say you own a, a landscaping or a... Well, my property's got lychees, carambolas, mangoes, and... Okay, so yes, absolutely. That's what you want to do if you have... You, you, can move from, you can move within the tree with that saw, but if you're going to go to the next tree, then you're going to want to sanitize. What, if you're using a chainsaw, if you're using a handsaw. And not only that, but you want to make sure that that ratio stays, uh, stays potent enough so that if you're using it down the line, it's, it's still there for you to be able to do what you need to do. Yes, way in the back. Five mils of Clorox to a hundred of water, and okay. then use ten percent of that. Okay. Reduces it down, but double check with Steve Arthur okay. on that. Okay. All right. What, nice what, notes. They changed the uh, concentration from five point two five to eight point two five. All right. So maybe you could drop that down to two to one, right around in there. So. Uh, and back to his cleaning the saw. Can right. you spray that chlorine bleach dilution on? I would submerge it because I don't think you're going to be able to, to knock off as much as you want to. What I would have is I would have two saws, all right? That's what I would have, maybe three. And you have, you know, two of them sitting in this solution and you're using one. And then you're done with that and then you can bring another one in. So I would do that. Yes? I'm sorry? Yeah, that's a good question. That's why I would recommend maybe once an hour or so, once two hours, going ahead and, and redoing that solution. Because that saw or whatever it is, if you're using a chainsaw, you're going to put the chain in there. So I think it breaks down pretty quickly. And this is especially if, you know, when you're, and this is kind of a little bit off the topic, but if you're pruning palms especially, <laughs> because a lot, of the, a lot of diseases are phloem carrying diseases so that when you're, when you're going ahead and uh, trimming trees, you can easily go from one tree to a next to a next. I've seen that a lot of the, <laughs> uh, in a lot of the... Uh, HOA had to pay for two, royal, two um, queens to come out. Okay. Well, you're lucky they weren't uh, Canary Island date palms. Yeah, <laughs> Queens we can live with, but you're losing those canaries. Whew. All right, so so you want to you you want to be able to uh, prolong long periods of, of wetness. So if it, if it's going to be if it's going to be raining and you know you're your plants are outside and it's going to be exposed to rain, you don't want to irrigate before that or you don't want to irrigate uh, going into the evening if there's going to be a lot of dew on that plant. So prolonged periods of time. Uh, new pots, store new pots in sanitized area and if you are going to reuse those pots you want to you want to go in there and re-sanitize those as well. That's that one to three ratio of bleach and we're going to we're going to change that a little bit, aren't we, because of the new potency. Increase spacing to increase canopy dryness, right? Because, you know, within those canopies, the stomates are going to open up. They have those guard cells and irrigation, or, or not irrigation, but water is going to come out of it. And if you have those plants two packed together, you're always going to have that, that zone where you can have uh, moisture around your, your plants. Let's see. Ah, here's some cultural controls. Workers in the greenhouse should avoid wearing brightly colored clothing. Okay? Because you can just, you know, you're going to get these insects, they're going to come to it, they're going to hitchhike their way in. So uh, it's just, you know, it's something to, it's something to think about. Um, yeah. thing that you forgot about when we were talking about the increased moisture, uh -huh. you can also increase your fan. Yes. Mm -hmm.
and you know, sometimes a lot of the, in, in the commercial areas, sometimes they'll go ahead and they'll put like a, a mesh or something over the, the fan to prevent insects from coming in and kind of cuts down on that circulation. So yeah, but you're right, increase, increasing your, your fan for sure. All right, uh, what else? Things like keeping your, the ends of your hoses hung up, making sure that your, your hoses aren't dripping. Uh, irrigation should be treated as a uh, potential method for, uh, for passing along diseases. So what we see right here is at one time what was going on is that plants, this is a nursery where plants were sitting on top of these, on top of these bricks, but what they did was that when they moved these pots, they didn't bother to turn that zone off so a lot of the, uh, it was being irrigated and all that area was always wet and they had a lot of algae problems in here. So that was, you can see, see it right up in here, in there. Avoid activities, right? Uh, that could result in splashing water early in the morning. If this disease is gonna be passed along, it's gonna be passed along from moisture on a plant. You're working along you can press, Spread that along quite, a, uh, quite quickly. Tomato fields, vegetable f uh, places that harvest, that pick, they wait till that dew is off of the plant because these, you know, these folks are just picking right away and uh, they can spread disease like that very quickly. So you know, when you're overwatering the house plants, this is what can, can potentially happen, right? But we never do that, do we? So let's take a look at some of the greenhouse structures. The, the, the research that I did is that you want something that's at least 14 feet wide, but there's all kinds of different greenhouses. Heck, you can have a greenhouse, the window, you can have all different types. But they're saying that when you want to start one up, if you're going to build one or if you're going to have one built at least 14 feet wide by 14 to 20 feet long, uh, you want to lay out your you want to lay out your benches in the north-south because of the, of the uh, axis of the sun. Uh, have those benches at least, what, 30 inches high, 33 inches wide. And here's the, the if you're going to be up north, and not Melbourne, <laughs> we're talking north, uh, it's going to be uh, heated a, a little bit more or cooling and then 33 inches wide. Now you take a look at this particular setup right here. Uh, you're gonna want your floor to always remain clean. You notice how these are, how these are uh, separated right here a little bit more, but where can a potential problem be with this layout here? Overhead. This overhead right up here, right? You're watering up here and it's dripping down on this. So, but they do have, they do have the benches that will have the uh, little slots in them so that irrigation water can drop down here. You just gotta make sure that you clean that water up uh, and that it doesn't stand around for long periods of time. You can put a drain in there, that can, yeah, sure. All right. So the, the, the irrigation systems that I had, uh, I had looked at, it have a misting system, which is a PVC pipes and nozzles, right? Heads are about 18 inches above the plants and then a, a drip feed system right here, or hand watering system. I think most, unless you've set up a, unless you've set up a fairly decent irrigation system, I think most of you are gonna go with this hand watering right in here. And if, you're, if you are setting up an irrigation system, to me, where I would want my water to be is right down at the root system. So you could either go with a, a 5 8 blue poly and run some uh, eighth inch spaghetti hose, uh, uh, spaghetti tubing off of that with a little trickle stick and put it directly into the pot. You could do that. And then if you wanted to, you could probably go ahead and fertigate with that. That to me is a good system. But if you have a lot of plot, a lot, a lot of plants, then you got a lot, of, what do you have? You got a lot, a lot of little tubes going. So another thing that I had thought about was if you have your, your pot and then, you know, maybe just go ahead and, and run an irrigation line above that with maybe, you know, with maybe some, some misting heads or, or something like that so that when you are irrigating, it's right at the root zone and then dropping down like that instead of being way overhead. 
Well, I'll tell you what the problem that I don't like about it and the reason that I don't recommend it in ornamental nurseries is that it can lead to, uh, to plant disease that it can lead to too much water on the leaf surface for too long. If it gets too warm, then uh, that can definitely... Well, it's more efficient also, when you start to think about that. I mean, if you're gonna go ahead and, if you're gonna go ahead and, you know, you wanna water, and, and again, I look at this on a commercial basis where, okay, well, how much does irrigation water cost you? Well, maybe it's coming out of a canal or something, but still, you gotta run those pumps, and if you're gonna fertigate, then, you know, you're gonna wanna get that, that right to, right to the root structure. So, and if you're hand watering, then you know you can just go along there and and hand water with it, and you can get right to those to those root systems. Okay, so you want to water more often when that plant is actively growing. Uh, you're going to want to water in the water in the morning, maybe about an hour after sunrise. Uh, you know, maybe it, uh, during the day, but going into the night, you don't want to water too late into the evening, maybe an hour or an hour or, or two before sunset. Because after all, I, when it, you know, when the sun goes down, the plant kind of just turns off. You know, it just, it isn't, it isn't doing what it does. It doesn't translocate water. It isn't as efficient as it is during the day. So if you're putting water in there, there's a chance that it's not going to be able to be translocated through that plant and you could get a root rot problem. Sir? Yes. They do most of the transfer. Yeah, it's like uh, okay. Like say uh, cactuses. I don't know if you're familiar. Mm -hmm. with yeah. Do you have any applications that maybe are similar with camp plants? What yeah. do they do with the irrigation? So the stomates open up at night yeah. for. So you don't have any problem with root rots by, by doing that? Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm just saying that at night, if you're, if you're irrigating at night, you don't have any problems with the... Well, that's what I just want to know. What, what, they do, there are problems, if they, especially if they're, if they're not high enough. Like, you know, phytotropha is going to be something of an issue for cattle. So do it during the daytime, and they'll store it at night, and then they'll irrigate the plant All right, so uh, there's many variable, uh, uh, variables uh, with your water, uh, so you want to constantly test for your pH and for your, for your salts. So one of the tools that you're going to want in there is a water meter. Ah, now, let's look at fertilizing, and, and this is where I really like to start a conversation, because I had talked with, with a gentleman over here, right, and, and there's, there's Everyone, it seems to want to fertilize a little bit differently when it, when it comes to, to orchids. So what I looked at is that if you're looking at an inert material like, like rock or something like that, or if you're growing on uh, those sorts of uh, substrates, that you're going to want a one-to-one-to-one, -to -one -to -one, whatever is 10, 10, 10, 30, 30, 30, one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio. If you're going to grow an organic material, you're going to want to go 3, 1, 1, because what happens is, is that uh, the, as that material starts to break down and you're, you're fertilizing, the, the carbon in that substrate is going to be used uh, most efficiently to help break that substrate down. So you might want to go uh, 3 one, one. Uh, feeding weekly or uh, every two weeks uh, at a quarter strength or going ahead and irrigating and then once you're irrigating go back with that maybe the next time and and fertilize. Uh, soluble fertilizer, one and a half teaspoons uh, per gallon. Uh, slow release, how many of you are using slow release in your, 
Yeah, so uh, I think that's, uh, again, that is uh, temperature dependent. Uh, you can get two to three months out of it, but again, if it's really hot or if you're irrigating quite a bit, you might not get as, as much out of that. Uh, Osmocote, who's using Osmocote on any of their? No, we don't. Dynamite. Yeah. Yep, dynamite's better. All right. Uh, Pro-Grow, uh, Mag Amp, uh, dry material, looking at uh, tablespoon per six inch pot that's, uh, that's applied. It could be applied monthly on dry material. So you might do, you might go ahead and use a liquid and then a dry behind it, a combination of that. Any others? Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Yes. Plant a coat. Anyone hear that? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I do that. I grow vegetables vertically in my backyard, and I'm on city. And I had my my water tested, and it was on the uh, alkaline side to it. So what I'll do is I will, per every gallon of solution that I make, I'll put in about a cup of white wine vinegar, and then I also use uh, a 1500 calcium uh, nitrate. Uh, of course, that'll also help with my blossom end rot mm -hmm. and, and other things of that nature. And then I use a, a 612, uh, yeah, 612-28 uh, in solution. So yeah, absolutely. And that, that entire ratio was based on me testing my water. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Responding, mm -hmm. yeah, because that what you're doing is you're able in solution, being able to get that fertilizer to release to be able to use in plant growth. So what happens sometimes when your pH is either too high or too low, uh, your your element from that fertilizer is stuck to the water or to the soil, and it just can't get pulled off of that, off of that off of that substance to be able to be utilized efficiently. How much do you think that that changes, like from season to season, like when we're having a lot of rain, how much of that, I mean, do you need to send it in frequently to get tested so you know you're matching what your water is doing now? That, that's a, yeah, excellent question. If you're, if you were, if you're uh, irrigating out of a canal, definitely, you're going to have to check that all the time because, you know, it can get, it can, you know, no rain, canal water in this area, it can get salty, right? We have a very uh, high water table, again, so, you know, we can have salts in the water. So I would, I would test on, on a yearly basis, yeah, from crop to crop for sure. Season season. Dry season, winter season. Yeah, like season. Well, you know, I think that if it's a really, really dry season, you're going to know pretty much that that salt is going to start to build up. And, and so that you, you may want to go ahead and test that just to see, you know, if you're going to need a buffering agent, what the ratio on that buffer is going to be. So, no. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, we had, yeah, uh, Epsom salts is uh, magnesium sulfate. Yeah, so, and potassium nitrate. You need the potassium in your plant to be able to, to move that Epsom salts through it. So, yeah, and you know, again, I go back to my, to my landscaping and nursery roots where with palm fertilizer, we were looking at an 80124. Okay, the four was the magnesium, but it came from a source called Kieserite, which is mined in Germany. That's mined in Germany. And it's a slow release, but it's not real slow. I mean, because sometimes you want that, you want that plant to be able to take up that, that magnesium. So, yeah. 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 We we can test. We send it out. Okay, Broward won't test it. Yeah, I send it out to Waters. Yeah, I send it out to Waters Lab up in Georgia. There's a couple other places. I also have a TDS and pH meter that I keep in my office. So, I mean, it's a good one, and I I can test water. I do that a lot because I work with vegetable growers and things like that. So. Well, then you'd want something a little bit more complicated. Our, the university, UF, yeah. you can send up a water analysis to them as well. Will they still do it? Sure, yeah, okay. absolutely. And what you're going to want to do, if you're going to want a water analysis, you're going to just go ahead and put it in a 12-ounce uh, 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 plastic bottle, but make sure you run your water a little bit first, and then go ahead and, and fill that up. Mm-hmm. But they give you the ratio, and you can look at other fertilizer. You, yeah. yeah, you can figure it out if you want to use something else. So Peter's will do that? Uh-huh. Yeah. There's a charge. It's like for 30, $30, $40. Yeah. It's on their website and the form and everything to do it. And they're good on the phone. Yeah, if you're in this county, I and mean, even if you're not in this county, give me a call, and I've got a number of water testing sites in Florida that I can send to you. Well, and depending on what county you are in Florida, your extension agent can make recommendations. Right. We can make them in this county. I, <laughs> I can. But we're not all and they're here. pretty good, actually. <laughs> All right, Google, yeah. So uh, fertilizing, anybody else who want to contribute to this? Because you know, I got, I'll be honest with you that yeah, I'm, I'm not as strong in, in, in fertilizing on the, on the uh, Catalias as I am, you know, normal, uh, normal, <laughs> normal, oops. <laughs> and obviously my foot's in my mouth and I got to get it out of here, so. But uh, any, other, any other questions on that? Uh, that is a uh, calcium magnesium combination. Like a Calmag, yeah. All right. You can go. And again, we're here, Extension is here for you.